everyone, I am your co-host Sierra and welcome to Making Sense of Success, a podcast dedicated to all forms of success and empowerment. Stay tuned every Saturday for new episodes. Find us on Instagram at makingsenseofsuccess.pod and email us at makingsenseofsuccess at gmail.com if you would be interested in sharing your story. Hi Deanna, did you maybe want to give our listeners a brief bio about yourself? Sure, yeah. My name is Deanna Bermudez. Um, I'm a, a British actress, but I'm of Colombian Native American descent. And um, I, I mean, that's me, really. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can find out more as, as we continue chatting, I guess. That sounds good. <laughs> we like to ask our guests like two pretty big questions at the very beginning Mm -hmm. um just to get the spices all right and to get the pot stirring just a little bit um so what is the best piece of advice you've ever received or given to somebody oh wow that's a that's a big question yeah Um, (laughs) no pressure (laughs) you know um the first thing that springs to mind is always pursue what you love doing and by what 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 that means is i think you know a lot of young people feel this pressure to decide what they want to study you know um as they're growing up and i always try to fit into this academic um model of thinking i guess i, I don't know how to say it. i i always try to pursue a more academic route um but i always had a passion for acting and drama and whatever I try to do in the academic sense something always pulled me back to my love of of acting and performing and um I've ended up in a job where I obviously get to do what I love and I I told my my goddaughter this um because she she just doesn't know what to do you know she's 13 and she's already been asked being asked to make choices and she just doesn't know you know what what subject should I continue doing? And so I always just tell her, just keep doing the subjects or the hobbies or whatever that, that, that inspire you, that you love. Don't just do maths because you're good at it and, um, and you should do it. Like do drama because you love it or do art because you love it. Do maths if you love it, but it's if you really love it, keep, keep doing it, I guess. Yeah, that was a long-winded way of saying that, but... <laughs> That's, that I think is, is good advice because I think, you know, you need to, you need to love what you do in life. Yeah, you do. You really do. I don't know what I'm doing with my life, but I I bet that you really do need to love what you're doing. (laughs) But I think that's a really good point though, at least here in Canada, like we're kind of, we, in like the middle of high school, we kind of have to choose what, uh, kind of career path we want to follow because we need to pick the right courses and have the right like prerequisites to be able to qualify for um, the university program or college program that we want to apply to and I think that's really hard at the age maybe of like you were saying from 13 to like 17 to be able Mm. to pick what you want to do for the rest of your life like that's a very pressuring question (laughs) yeah and you're so young it's exactly the same it works here in the uk uh, in the uk you know you you slowly start um kind of getting rid of the subjects that you don't want to do because and you have to have what you want to do in mind like at university Mm -hmm. because if you haven't done that then you can't do the subjects that you uh, that you want to study at university so it it feels like so much pressure because she was 12 when she had to make her first choices and oh, I just wow. think 12, I, I only knew I wanted to be an actor when I was 21. Like, oh, wow. how, I mean, yeah. you know, as in like, I decided to pursue that right. properly at 21. You know, yeah. I, I just don't understand how, how a 12 year old is expected to start making those decisions. And that's why I just said to her, just keep the subjects that you really enjoy. And that, that, and then it doesn't matter what career will come out of that because you doing those subjects will inform what you should be doing in your later life as opposed to you thinking I'm going to be a doctor so I have to do you know uh, sciences and maths or I don't even know what doctors have to study to be fair but (laughs) no definitely those two definitely those two yeah no I think I had 
it was funny for me, like my high school experience in, we have like 11th and 12th grade and then you go into university, um, Mm -hmm. in high school. And for me, I had, I think I chose sciences and maths and I kept like some social sciences in my 11th grade. Because those are like the years that uh, universities start actually looking at your grades that they like count for. Mm. And then by 12th grade, I dropped all my sciences. And I think I took like data management, which is more of like the easier math per se, mm-hmm. <laughs> call it. Because I, I realized I just, what I really like is social sciences. Like I, I knew I didn't really want to go into science or math anymore. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, it's hard though because it you is. you fill up your like course prerequisites or the amount of courses you have, and that's the the only space you have to take. You <laughs> can't take yeah. more or less necessarily. In America, it's pretty different. I, I'm pretty sure it's different from what you guys are saying, just because like you're required to take like each certain class like every single year of like high school, and then say you took like one class and you got college credit for it then you didn't have to take a certain class in college but you pretty much had to take all of the same classes again in college yeah oh yeah so like you have to take like a bunch of like art classes like social science classes lab classes even if it's like not your major oh wow really whoa that's weird okay (laughs) that's why it's like uh, like going to college is such like a difficult thing here Hmm. because People see it as like it's a literal waste of time if it's mm. not something that you're really concerned about. You could say like, like yeah, I don't want to use moving forward. Really, yeah. Like I have to take a pottery class, like some sort of science, like art class that's like literature or pottery or painting or film. Wait, and this is sorry. So by college, you mean university? Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, that. I mean that's that's really odd <laughs> yeah because <laughs> it's like we literally just studied the subject that we studied that's it we don't so do did that. we yeah like yeah. so did I really that's insane like you don't get to study what you're really going to school for until like your third or fourth year of college oh my god if like you're if you're lucky maybe like your second year of college super super lucky but like you know it's weird yeah <laughs> Yeah, I've never heard of that format okay. before. I don't know. Yeah. America. I yeah. don't understand it. <laughs> Interesting. Period. Interesting. <laughs> so maybe moving on to like our second big question. What does success mean to you, Deanna? So success, I mean, it's such a it's, it's such a an interesting idea, I think, because for me success changes often, uh, depending on how I feel or you know I'll watch a motivational speaker and my idea of success changes so it's like it's it's a fluid idea success um but I think that you know people can get trapped into the idea that you can only be happy once you're successful and whatever that success is it's like oh I have to um make a million dollars you know uh, and then I'll be successful or you know, once my com- once I've made my own company, that's success to me. And really, <laughs> or, or for example, I mean, once I win an Oscar, then I'll know I'm, I'm successful, you know. But the reality is um, su- success is, is all the, the little things as well. So, like, I like to do this every couple of months. I look back at how far I've come and I go, whoa, Oh my gosh, I'm I'm so much further than what does further mean? I've done so many things that I'm really happy and proud of um, in this last year or in this these last few months, and that reminds me of my success um, in the current moment. So it's about it's about acknowledging your wins in the now as opposed to always kind of this elusive success in the future yeah, yeah. It does. that yeah, to me sure. is <laughs> success oh, does that make sense <laughs> <laughs> yeah because I, I i mean honestly when i was about 18 oh, wow. i remember my parents had left um the country they moved back to colombia and i was living by myself for the first time and i was this was you know I dropped out of university (laughs) I'd um I'd 
I was working in like an admin job. I had no notions of actually becoming an actor at this point. Um, and I remember not even having enough money to get the bus to go to work. And so then I think back to that kind of moment in my life um, where I was frantically like looking at the side of the sofa, looking for pennies, you know, to try and get enough money for the bus. And then I look at my life now and I'm, think you know I, I have a lovely apartment I have a wonderful supportive partner I'm doing a <laughs> job that I love so much I get paid for having mm-hmm. fun I mean it is work as well but it's a lot of work but it, there is a lot of enjoyment in that because you know it's it's what I love doing and I just think wow of course I'm a success sure I've got goals that I'd like to you know pursue but mm-hmm. It's about reminding myself, like, I, I, am, I am a success because I'm alive. <laughs> I'm alive and I'm living my best life. Like, sure, it can be better, but, like, now, you know, in the present that. moment. That's, like, I the reason why we started the podcast. I know. Right there. <laughs> I was thinking about it. We haven't really heard a definition like that. Anyone give a definition like that looking back, like, um, at your <laughs> wins and seeing how far you've come. Yeah, I don't think we've mm-hmm. had that definition yet. <laughs> Because I think people forget, you know, you, you get so trapped in this, in this like um, vision that you have of, I want this in my life, that you, you, you kind of lose sight of everything you're doing. And then, and then I feel like you stop living in the now. And that's so easy to do. I think so many of us, the, the way that society is built is like, it, you know, we're driven to pursue these goals and everything's like, what's your goal? What's your vision in life? And it, yes, I think it is important to have a vision in life, but I think that you, you still have to acknowledge how much you've done because otherwise I think it can be demoralizing if you don't look back and you don't kind of acknowledge like, oh, mm-hmm. this time last year, I hadn't, I hadn't ever done a podcast before, you know, like that's an achievement. And, and you guys should definitely kind of go, wow, you know, I had an idea of a podcast. Now I'm actually interviewing people and that's success. Exactly. So you, you just can't it. lose it. It. sight of, of, of the now, basically. What is something like that you're most <laughs> like proud of? Like what's has been the most rewarding to you of all of your successes? I okay, so here's 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 what I'm really proud of. Um I'm proud of the fact that despite the industry that I work in being a really tough industry, um I have continued uh, you know, through the up through the downs, um, and I'm still a working actress I'm still succeeding in my profession um whilst I know that many others have found it so demoralizing that they've they've given up um so I'm proud of myself for still for still working basically (laughs) like I think it's a small thing to be uh, proud of but um you know when you think about it only the top three percent of actors are the ones that people know about and that make you know, the big millions. Um, and a lot of actors give up. I mean, I've heard so many actors that I that are, are you know, um, famous now, um, who, who have all said, I was about to give up, I was on the cusp of giving up. And then they, they didn't. And then look at them now, it's kind of, um, I mean, that's really inspiring, of course, because mm-hmm. this industry sometimes isn't about whether you're good or not. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think kind of continuing to pursue my dream, um, that's success in itself. And that's what I'm really proud of myself for continuing to make myself a better actor, to um, <laughs> to continue training and continue So I'm kind of curious because you had mentioned life, earlier that um, at 18, your parents had um, moved back to Colombia. Um, how was that? Like how, what challenges did you face and how do you think that's maybe helped you along yeah. like your path now into acting as well? Um, so, I mean, it was probably... Um, at the time, I remember, obviously, you know, you're, you're 17 and your parents go, oh, we're going to probably move move back uh, to, to Colombia. Um, <laughs> and obviously, I was about to start university and I thought, 
woo, I get to live by myself. And like, <laughs> and you know, I didn't understand. I, I was kind of excited more than um, anxious or any of that. And then I remember when my parents left, I, I remember sitting in the airport yeah. bawling my eyes out because um, the reality of what was happening finally hit me. I thought, whoa, I have no family, no other family here, you know. I was literally by myself. Um, but, I, I mean, I'd, I'd been very responsible. I'd, I'd already moved out. I was living at 18. I moved out and I was living by myself. Um I, you know, I had a part-time job and I was getting ready for university. Um, so then when they left, yeah. I guess yeah. it really was my time to become <laughs> an adult. <laughs> and um, I, I'll, I'll just say I failed miserably. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, like um, I, I dropped out of university. I was um, studying French and Spanish. My idea was to become a, a translator and I, I oh, wow. went to one of the top universities in London. I went to King's College and I hated it. I absolutely just hated the whole experience. Um, then there was a problem with my student finance and I wasn't getting the money that I was meant to get to help me during, because mm-hmm. you know, over mm-hmm. here in the UK, we get student finance. So um, we, we get a loan essentially to, to pay for our university. And I remember that happening. And I, again, like, you know, finance, I was... I was 18 I didn't really understand how all these things worked and I didn't know what to do in that sense I wasn't getting money I couldn't pay my rent um all these things happened I hated university I hated the classes I I felt just overwhelmed um and and so I I I dropped out (laughs) and I remember calling my mum and kind of just crying and that for her she was like oh my god because we they would only, they'd only been in Colombia for about uh, five months at that point. And, um, you know, they, they'd they bought a house and they were, like, doing it up. And, um, and I had to kind of just learn life by myself in that sense. I think it was a really, even though at the time I felt it was, I was really struggling, I didn't know what to do. But it was a, such a valuable tool because it kind of made me look at my life and go, right, what do I need to do? Mm-hmm. I have found myself a job, um, you know, and that was at the time when I had no money to get to the job. <laughs> but um, um, I, I found myself a, a job. I started working. Um, um, and then I, I just didn't know what to do with my life at that point. And I remember that I... Um, Okay. I saw back we have um, Gumtree over here, I think which is like a Craigslist or Craigslist or however you and I remember seeing something on there about teaching English in Italy and I thought, hey, that sounds that sounds great because I love traveling and I decided, mm-hmm. okay, I'm gonna put myself out there and I start, I, I, I did this application to go and work abroad abroad and um and I got through and funnily enough, <laughs> my parents decided to come back because my mum was like, we can't leave Deanna yet. She's she's obviously like just not ready Aww. to be left by herself. <laughs> my parents decided to, to move back to the UK. After, oh, wow. After, <laughs> they were like, yeah, okay, bye. bye. <laughs> um, and then I, I went off to Italy, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like we... we, we we crossed over for about a month um, and then I went to Italy um, and in Italy um, that was where I basically um, the company that I was working for they had a theatre company and I saw these performers um, that they performed for us we were like the, the, the in our induction to be the new English teachers they performed and I just said that's what I want to do and oh, within wow. two months I was um, in the uh, theatre company <laughs> and it was like so, so I know that that one kind of it was like um uh what was that what's that called uh, when a series of events has happened and it all kind of spirals to one uh, you know what? <laughs> uh, yeah that so basically it was, a, it was like a catalyst I don't know that's not the that's not really the word but it, essentially my parents moving was a catalyst for all all of that to happen to then finally lead me to what I wanted to do um because then once I was in that theatre company I 
it was the best feeling. Um, I learned so much from the other actors who were who were trained actors. I I was like not a trained actor. Um, I just always done drama as a hobby, and I loved drama, but I just never thought I could be an actor. And then that year in Italy, performing and touring all over Italy. Um, it was just so inspirational I knew that that was what I wanted to do and because my mum was like but Diana you have to go to university um I decided to go to drama school after that and um, whilst I was in Italy I did my drama school application and yeah and then I went to university and uh, to drama school um and yeah and then here I am today <laughs> so yeah so I'm thankful. I'm thankful for that really terrible time in my life. <laughs> Did you end up going to university? Yeah, afterwards. I mean, to study okay. drama. Yeah. Oh, I, okay, cool. Yeah, so I, I did end up, but I ended up going when I knew that that was what I wanted to do. So yes, I dropped out. I was studying French and Spanish. Um, and then I all this happened. And then because my mom did want me, and, you know, I think that's... Um, like I, I was the first one in her family to go to university and it, you know uh, she really just wanted me but this time I was doing it with what I wanted to do and not because academically I should be doing the subjects that I'm good at you know this was okay I want to do this and and it was a brilliant experience I absolutely loved um, going to drama school so yeah Deanna you were like oh I don't want to like tell people what to do or like have people's parents be mad but I think it is really really important that people learn or people realize that there are other people that have been in the shoes that they are in Mm. and you dropping out of school and feeling like you're gonna fail at life and you don't know what you're doing is by far like one of the most important things that needs to be talked about you Mm. could say just because like we're all so wrapped up in oh my god this isn't gonna happen oh my god like no one has been in my shoes. I want to drop out, but I don't know what to do. No one's been in my shoes before. And I think it's so important for people to listen to this in any sort of school, mm. not just traditional university or a trade school or like anything like that, because everybody has a different path and sure. it just might take a, some people longer to find their path. And I think, and I thank you for telling your story because it's very moving and very very authentic and amazing oh thank you <laughs> <laughs> but also I just just to say even though I did go I did end up you know going to mm. university I I still feel that if I hadn't I would have continued on like I had already planned what I was going to do um like um I was going to go to Germany oh, and work wow. in a theatre company there you know and then come back to Italy um then there was another theatre company that I'd heard of in China that some of some of my you know my other actor colleagues were going to so it was like I definitely like even if I hadn't gone to university I would have pursued the, this career and I could have mm-hmm. because now I had the experience because sometimes you know especially it, depending on on what job you do you know sometimes it's the experience that counts more than the educational oh, sure. academic academic route um yeah I I remember I met um I met um this guy one time and he was I don't know head of head of something at this massive company here in London and he was only 26 and I thought wow that's really impressive and he he basically said I just um got myself into into this company in the lowest position I I just come out of well, I guess high school it would be over you, mm-hmm. for you guys. So he was like 16. He got himself a job, I don't know, like in, in the post room or something. And he just worked his way up into the company and he was 26. So it was like, imagine if he'd actually gone to, to university and graduated, like he wouldn't be at that level. So there are different ways to get to where you want. It doesn't necessarily have to be that academic route. So there's another way mm-hmm. of thinking about it. Totally, totally. So while we have you, I I was also curious to find out what inspired you to really like become an advocate and activist for indigenous populations. Because I noticed, <laughs> yeah, that's something that you're passionate about, I think. Yes. Yeah, no, it, it is. Um, so 
this is going to be a really long-winded answer. Okay. No, it's, it's yours. I mean, I think because because I I because I still haven't formulated like a, a shortened version of this uh, of this. Because it isn't the first time I've been asked, but um, let me let me <laughs> let me think about it. Okay. Um. So growing up in the UK, um, there is not a lot of representation for I guess well a indigenous peoples um there is a small latinx community um here in London and I grew up in the the latinx community and that's what I thought I was right and and I mean Mm -hmm. that's a cultural identity it's not a race right so there's, there's a differentiation there and then I kind of I went to college and I kind of left that whole latinx world behind uh I went to Italy and then it was like I mean over there I, they just thought I was Asian like all oh, the wow. time okay. um, yeah. yeah they just have no concept no concept you know for them you go oh I'm 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 Latinx mm-hmm. oh like Shakira and it's like well no sh- I mean Shakira no <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, that's like one example but then this is the thing it was like that whole well, yeah but she's 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 got more like white and also she's a, a Italian Lebanese or something yeah. right she's it's also really confusing and so then it's like this whole thing of identity started coming up for me and that was even more prevalent when I went to university because in the in university there was this kind of there was um it was very uh uh white basically mm. like ac- academia in drama schools you know it's it's very white centric uh, and we're very Western. And so I know that a lot of like the, the black students kind of started speaking up about that. And they were like, but why, why are like, they kind of just started, um, yeah, speaking up. And I never knew where I fit in to this uh, conversation. And I was like, oh, I, I just, I don't know where I fit into mm. this, you know. Um, and that's when the confusion of, of my race and how I identified started to come up and I, I I'd never figured it out when I was at university. Um, I kind of observed both and I didn't feel like I, I fit in to both. I like, I didn't feel like I had the right to, to belong to the people of, of color essentially. Cause again, I just didn't know what I was. Um, and then after university, uh, I, I met my, my current partner and he, I, I, we were discussing it one day and he said, but you're Native American, right? And and this was seven years ago. And um, I kind of, it, 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 I, I, I remember feeling really like I'd been slapped in the face because I was like, uh, what do you mean? I, I'm, what? Mm-hmm. Like, I just didn't understand. And he just said it again. He was like, well, yeah, you're obviously Native American. You're, 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 you're indigenous and and I couldn't comprehend it it took me so long to understand and then I felt um okay let me go and research so I started researching you know uh, our real history which which we we don't get taught you know especially here in the UK I never got taught my real history and colonization and all of mm-hmm. that and that's when I started learning and understanding right okay so sure Latinx is a cultural identity where many races fit into that but what race am I um and I started going on this journey of discovery um and the more I started learning the more I kind of saw that um that indigenous rights and all these kind of topics are really under the radar um and I have a platform, like, you know, my platform started growing as I as I started pursuing acting more. And then I felt like I had a responsibility to be a role model because when I was younger, I never dreamed of being an actor because I never saw myself represented. I, mm. I didn't even know who I was, you know, even in, in like, um, South American films and um, telenovelas, mm-hmm. you know, you just see white Latinx people, like, you rarely see anyone that looks like me. And if you do, they're the baddie. Um, it, I just, I just felt, okay, well, I need to, I need to show that we're here. So <laughs> I think that's when it kind of started happening. And the more I got involved in the world and especially social media, I mean, there's, there's so many people on social media doing this kind of work. And so then I started connecting with lots of people and um, yeah. And then, within the community within the indigenous community and it's amazing because I can 
speak to like um like I was having conversations with an, indig- an indigenous group of women who live in Colombia and I just thought this is amazing through social media I'm able to connect with these indigenous women in, in Colombia you know and and I'm on the other side of the world at the moment um but I'm able to learn from them um and share their their kind of plight and because you know at the moment the indigenous communities are really affected by this whole covid situation and stuff so yeah that's how it started and um I feel like I have a responsibility but not only that I want to help because I think it's so important that we're represented and that people can see that sure I'm Latinx or that's my culture but actually hang on wait I need um uh, <laughs> I need to pause pause because I I, I uh, my no worries yeah <laughs> take your time it's okay <laughs> I, I sometimes get so passionate that I don't know where I, my head's at. Um, what, what I wanted to say was, um, so in South America, to be indigenous is really looked down mm-hmm. upon. Um, there's been so many conversations that I'd, I've had in the past where like they'll say with other Latinx people who will be like, oh, um, Oh God! You know, I had to tell my friend to stop being so so Indian. Oh wow! Like, really? Referring to people because it's used as a yeah. derogatory term. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, so I kind of have started to kind of reclaim pride in our race because when you learn about the history of our peoples, you, I remember thinking, you know, that whole. Um, that our peoples were were not civilized, mm-hmm. you know. That's how that's what we get taught. But when you really research, you see like, wow, we had amazing empires and and like amazing traditions. And it's such a shame that now people just don't take pride in that. And I think that's really sad. And so that's why I feel like I really want to celebrate our cultures and celebrate our people and not to have this shame um about <laughs> having indigenous mm-hmm. blood I think that's, that's, that's so, such a negative thing it's like no we should celebrate our people and celebrate our ancestors um yeah <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you'll edit that to make it more <laughs> no, it, was, it was really good no <laughs> <laughs> um but that was the massive journey that I went on discovering my identity <laughs> Yeah, and I think, I think it's really important for people to know about this and everything. It's definitely something, um, like, a really important thing in Canada as well, as you probably know, that um, mm. we do have quite a few different Indigenous populations. And um, yeah. luckily over the years, I think they've been able to have more of a platform to talk on, but we still have... Um, a lot of work that needs to go and there's still a lot of things that go on for example our reserves um for indigenous populations that uh they still some of them don't have really proper access to clean drinking water like the water isn't well run it's just yeah it's Mm. they're living in like to say sad to say but like third world conditions really in a first world country and there definitely needs to be more of a platform for them to be able to talk about these issues and be able to have these rights and be able to have access to proper for sure. cleaning water, water for example even at least the thing is at least like in kind of i mean the situation is terrible yeah. but at least you know about for it sure. in a way like over here <laughs> the amount of times that i've gone to i've said oh i'm i'm of native american descent and people might even go like wow really oh, does, I, they exist still. really wow <laughs> okay <laughs> that's yeah, in, in the UK, in the UK, there's there's very little concept of, or or they're they're like this mythical other being, and and yeah, so that's another kind of part of my of my teaching is you know, as in what I what I try and I guess mm-hmm. teach via social media is you know we're still here and we don't necessarily live the traditional way you know we that there's so many of us who are just living normal lives and I don't know yeah. like sure <laughs> it's like it's like we're more than the stereotype yeah so oh yeah. for sure and I think for me at mm. least when I really started to get um I guess educate myself more 
on it was I had learned about like the um, colonial history of it, begin like with the beginning of Canada and everything, uh, in regards to like indigenous populations, but I didn't really know how much it expanded down into like Latin America as well. How they had like it's pretty yeah. similar, like it's pretty much copy paste in that way. What happened? It really, is. it's just with Spain instead, mm-hmm. right? or um exactly. portugal but um that yep. i found out more from my parents obviously but then i really started to research i i really got passionate in my degree about uh women's empowerment and women's rights um so then i started mm-hmm. to look more into femicide and i was just so and like the machismo yes. culture how that has to do with that and i didn't realize how mm-hmm. much in like indigenous women were targeted in that way specifically yes. i looked at guatemala but it goes on throughout latin america obviously um, so I was wondering maybe if you could tell us more about, I know there's the national, uh, day of awareness for missing, um, and murdered indigenous women and girls, which we have here as well. And I know that you're familiar yes. with it. So, yeah. To tell you more about, sorry. Yeah. Maybe how, like, <laughs> no, I'm whole... not sure if you know, yeah. Like how it came about really. And like, how did it come about? I, 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 I don't know how the mm-hmm. movement actually came about, but I, I remember having this conversation with another with another um, native podcaster actually, and she she said it it seemed to just like appear in the last two three years. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 a relatively young movement uh, in that sense, but yeah, I, I, it started gaining traction. Um, obviously, the the handprint on the mouth uh, to represent all of the silence women um who are no longer with us um but um i guess now it's about spreading it's about spreading awareness for the fact that this is happening because the reality of the situation is is it kind of goes under the radar and um oftentimes when a woman goes missing uh, it, it's up it's left up to the family to raise money to search parties and you know they have to do the work um and that's 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 a bit unfair mm-hmm. because obviously you don't, we don't, you know, if, if my relative went missing I, I wouldn't even know how, where to start looking other than just going out and looking yeah. on the streets I mean it you know it so I think um the first step it was yeah was exactly raising awareness for the fact that this is happening it's still happening um and then trying to investigate why it's happening you know I, I always believe it's because of colonization mm-hmm. like yeah. still is basically the remnants of colonization still happening to this day um women are targeted uh more so than men i mean men are still targeted mm-hmm. um women girls two-spirit uh people um they're they're targeted most but it's if you look back at you know colon through back back then colonization you know women were always objectified sexualized raped targeted um and because of certain regulations, I don't, I, I obviously am not American, but my understanding of it is that on reservations, they don't have the same policing systems, which means that oftentimes um, people can commit crimes and get away with it. You know, people can come from outside, commit a crime, and because of the policing system is different, they're not, there's no um, retribution, mm-hmm. there's no, you know, there's nothing. So, mm-hmm. And then also what I've seen recently um, is that a lot of, you know, with all the pipelines, they're having these man camps. So these workers that come and then they're working under like hor- horrible conditions and they <laughs> they let off their steam yeah. by, I don't know, like going for the native women who are in the camps and then they're vulnerable nearby. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, this is what's going on. That's the mm-hmm. situation. Um, in South America, of course, it's like there's there's a movement called Ni Una Menos, um, which is not another woman mm-hmm. going missing um, or murdered. And it it's very much in the similar kind of vein where just these women are being objectified and sexualized and then they're worth, it's see it's like they're they're worthless yeah. like they just yeah it's, it's it's i don't know the the nuances of of um i don't know the nuances of it so clearly but i wait 
I'd love to read your dissertation or your essay that you my wrote. Essay? On, like, yeah, I can for sure send that to you if you'd like. Yeah, well, it was more, my essay was more on like, um, pa- like the patriarchy and how that's embedded within like these institutions, such as like law enforcement and even like the, um, like the legal system really ultimately, um, specifically within Guatemala, yeah, because- but yeah, and how that has been affecting like this whole issue of femicide going on. Um, well- well, exactly, because that, that's what that's it. I remember reading that um, that they don't take they don't differentiate. Um, so a woman can get killed because she's a woman. Mm-hmm. Right. Men will get killed for like, you know, robbery or, you know, uh, other other reasons yeah. other than men don't get killed because man. they're a man. Yeah, exactly. Right. So mm-hmm. that's that's a whole femicide thing. So a woman is seen as vulnerable. She's sexualized. She's objectified. She can get killed easily, and she gets killed because she's a woman, not because she did something. I don't know, like she was involved in a car accident or yeah. something. Yeah, she just got killed. It's it's honestly crazy. That, it's mind blowing. Like I don't I don't understand it at all. Like I can't really. Yeah, I can't really understand it at all mentally. I can't put really the pieces together in that way. Um, as mm. a woman, I, find, I and especially as Latin American, like I find it really, it's really hard to wrap my head around, especially living within like, um, like a Western society where course, I yeah. guess maybe you could call the just the justice system as like, I wouldn't say better, but different in that way, because there still are injustices that go on here as well. But yeah, definitely, yeah. I'm glad to see that um, there's someone out there like yourself who advocates for that. So especially on social media as well, like through such an important platform and also to have, I think here in Canada, now we have an observatory for femicide because there are femicides that go on here with our indigenous population specifically as well Mm. a lot. So yeah, I'm really glad to see that there are steps in the right direction though, that are taking action and there are people like yourself involved in that. Yeah, it, I think it for me it's just raising awareness, especially with a, with a, with a platform that where you're able to share this information. You know, it's important for people to know, especially. I mean, living in London, it's like a little bubble, mm. um, and sometimes people we know what's going on around the world, but we don't know about the smaller issues. Like, this isn't a small issue, but it's not in in the media, exactly. right? It's not in mainstream yep. media. So it's mm-hmm. smaller in that sense. Um, and so, yeah, so so I feel like I need to be sharing this with people who follow me. Oh, of course. <laughs> and I think for me, what was yeah. just really shocking about it all was that there are um, international instruments in place. However, at a national level that these things still go on and they're not accounted for, they're, they're just... Mm. Yeah, it's, it's really <laughs> upsetting, to be honest. It, it, yeah. Yeah. There. You guys <laughs> Seriously. opened my eyes to so many things. <laughs> um, not a lot of, like Deanna said, like not a lot of, it's not like media things you could say. It's like not the topic of media or in the media. So it's like really hard to familiarize yourself if it's not there. Mm, exactly. And it's mind-blowing that these things are happening but with the help of people who do advocate for so many different things like there will be a change and it's going to be amazing hopefully (laughs) that's what what we hope that's what we hope yeah but I do definitely think I mean it's it's so interesting I went um because I I'm a voice actor as well um as in I just use my voice to act as well (laughs) um but, and I went to a, a, an audition, um, which was a, a video game audition, and the director started talking to me about MMIW. And I just thought, I didn't right. see a murdered Indigenous women. And I was like, wow, how? And, he, and he'd researched me and he'd seen that and he found it such an interesting oh, topic. Awesome. And I just thought, oh my gosh, this is how change happens. You know, like, this, I know it's just one small interaction, but this was like a small interaction that I had become aware of. As opposed to, you know, I'm just trying to think of the people that come across my profile and start yeah. reading this. Like they, they gain that awareness. But to have that happen in an audition and to, to for him to have gone and actually researched it, to talk to me about it, I thought, well, there you go. That's a step in the right direction. Now this one person might bring it up 
to another person and it just you know the the awareness gets raised um, and that's that's the important thing because the more people know the more people will want to take action and do something about it or understand hey that's that's not right why is that still happening that's exactly what I was going to say but it's really interesting to see how you're contributing to this community of knowledge especially on the individual scale like the impact you're having with even just posting something on social media about it Mm. that's that's the beauty yeah, social of media. social media <laughs> yeah. it also has a very ugly side but that's one of the yeah, it's of it. the positive <laughs> to it so sure. maybe one of the one of like the last questions we like to ask our guests is um to maybe share one of their favorite local small businesses or uh sustainable or ethical product to give a shout out if you have one yeah i mean one uh, <laughs> So um, the the shout outs that I'd like to give are for um, some indigenous beadwork artists that I love because I I don't know if you look on my Instagram you'll see that I have a thing for earrings. Yes, I've, I've I, seen they're beautiful. <laughs> I love earrings. I counted them yesterday. I have forty pairs, and um, I could still buy more. <laughs> I absolutely love them, but um, I am particularly obsessed with all the the beadwork artists and. Um, Two of the, the girls that I'm going to mention are actually based in Canada. So mm-hmm. um, Sloan Autumn, she uh, she does a beautiful earrings and she designs them. Um, I think she's also, I believe she's studying or she might be in us. I can't remember, but but basically she's an in, she's she's doing this. You know, she, she she's just an independent little business, mm-hmm. I guess, um, doing her, her <laughs> earrings. Another one uh, who. I think they're friends. She's called Kesa Wesa, or I think I pronounced it right. Um, but again, she's another indigenous bead worker and, and she designs all of her own things as well. And the other one is Eye Candy Boutique. I think she's based in the US and she makes beautiful uh, earrings with like shelves and natural um, um Natural stuff. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the right. I'm not selling it properly, am I? Oh, they're gonna be like, what? Yeah. yeah, no. We'll definitely link those down below if you wouldn't mind passing us on, like their whether it be their Instagram or their website or whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I wanted to give a shout out because I I've bought a lot of uh, their stuff, um, and I always think it's great to support Indigenous artists, as you know from our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah and a lot of these women you know I mean it's incredible you go on um, Instagram and that's how I found all of these people by the way like because they, they don't have like online shops or anything right. I just follow um, other people who will post their designs and I, I just go oh I'd like to buy that thank you um, but it's it's all custom orders and things like that it's they, 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 in that sense they're they are like um they don't have an, like an online shop or anything like that, but um, I'm always up for supporting independent artists and businesses and people. <laughs> well, we wanted to thank you for coming on to the podcast. Um, and you if you on. had, yes, of course. And you're always welcome to come back on. Um, what do you want our listeners to take away from this episode? Oh my gosh, from everything I've just yeah. <laughs> spoken about. <laughs> um, I think that I'd like people to remember that we only have this one life and you should always be doing what you love to do, whether that's in your career or whether that's a hobby, like always just pursue your dreams and pursue what makes you happy. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. 